Hello and welcome to Fatima Today. This show is produced by the World Apostle of Fatima USA, Our Lady's Blue Army, and brings topics to you, our viewers, related to the events in the world today. We live in tumultuous times when logic seems to have disappeared and uncertainty hangs over us. Our hope on these programs is to address the issues of the day and find solutions through adherence to the laws of God, especially through the message of Fatima. We ask that you subscribe to this podcast. Welcome to Fatima today. My name is Barb Ernster. I'm your host. And today I have with me Mark Moran. Mark is the vice president of the Byzantine Division of the Blue Army. He has a master's degree in philosophy and theology from John Carroll University in Cleveland. And he's written extensively on the heresy of modernism. That's going to be our topic today, modernism. So before I bring Mark on, I'm going to start with a Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm bringing Mark Moran. Mark, hello. Say hello to everybody. Hello. Thanks for having me, Barb. <laughs> so I'm glad you're on. You are, you've are. written extensively on the heresy of mar- modernism. Now, St. Paul, the pot, or so. St. Pope Pius X wrote a famous encyclical about it, and he called modernism the synthesis, synthesis of all heresies. And so let's start there. First of all, explain to us what modernism is and why did Pope Pius X call it the synthesis of all heresies? Yes, uh, modernism uh, was a heresy that was uh, condemned by Pope Pius X in Pascendi. Pascendi was an early encyclical written in the early 20th century of his pontificate. And St. Pius X was very concerned about it because it just started to come out and various priests and seminaries were becoming infected with these new ideas. And many of these individuals were priests such as uh, Terrell and also uh, Losi. And Terrell was a Jesuit and Losi was a French priest. And they began writing extensively about science and its relationship to faith. Now, in the previous century, the 19th and the 18th century, the Enlightenment brought about a a drastic change in how the scientific method approached objects. Everything had to be observable, tested, to be proven to be, uh, in in fact, a fact itself. So theories were tested. Beginning with that, then, we have atheists and other agnostics beginning to test the faith itself, various miracles that were once taken uh, as fact, as truth, began to be doubted in these circles, such as uh, the crossing of the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, mm-hmm. or the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, these began to become questioned because they went against what you would refer to as the norms of science. So there was a movement uh, within these scientific realms, very atheistic in nature, called logical positivism. And the logical positivists were very vehemently uh, anti-religion. They even believed that any type of words to describe religion were useless because they didn't pertain to reality itself. So they were very anti-metaphysical. So the modernist movement was began not by atheists, but by religious individuals who were scientific in mind, but also still believed in God. So modernists, to some extent, are agnostic, but they're also very much theists. Uh, Mm -hmm. They are not atheists. They do believe that God does exist. They, however, believe that God behaves in accordance with the natural laws of science, which God governs. Mm -hmm. So So they don't really believe that God was the creator of the science, the natural laws. Is that, I mean, they kind of discount the creation that he's the... They believe uh, he created, uh, but not maybe according to how it is relayed in scripture itself. They believe he is the source of creation, that God is the source of it. But when we hear of God interacting in history through miracles, this goes against the scientific norm. Okay, so in other words, God is contained by science. 
Yes, yeah, that is one of okay. the big thing, one of their big proponents. Uh, some of their articles, Alfred Wrighthead wrote, Why God Cannot Act in History. And they actually believe that's part of his very nature, that he is constrained by the own natural laws that he created, that he does not change them. Okay. And because of that, we don't have miracles because miracles can be observed. So these religious men who wanted to remain scientific began to reinterpret the faith itself, but under a modern prism. They tried to make a Holy Mother Church more attractive to the modern world. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, they betray her without really even right. knowing it. Matter of fact, Pius talked about they're always very astonished when they're corrected. But he said that we have to expose them for what they really are, badly disguised men. So they're pretending to be Christians, and they think they're doing a, such a great service, like Lousy and Terrell did. But in fact, they're destroying the faith by trying to make it more modern in appearance, making it more science friendly. And in the end, uh, the logical positive still mocked them. They never accepted theism regardless because they were devout atheists. But this was just for them to be able to try to make a bridge between modern empirical science, which is bound by physical laws, to try to make metaphysics more palpable to the reasonable Christian, so to speak. Uh, but in doing so, it ultimately destroyed the faith because one of the biggest miracles, as we all well know, is the incarnation. And the incarnation involves God acting in history by emptying himself into the form of a slave, taking upon a human nature, retaining his divine nature, and becoming a God slash man. Mm -hmm. And that is totally unacceptable to the modernist mind. So throughout the history of modernism, there is a denial. So it's a Christological heresy. This is where one of the synthesis parts that you mentioned. It's a synthesis of all heresies. Well, this is the Christological element of it. Modernists do not believe Jesus is God. Uh, okay. In fact, at the universities, they're very sly in how they word it. They say that the spirit of God is in Jesus Christ, or mm -hmm. there's uh, uh, an enlightenment of Jesus. So you, those are some buzzwords to watch out for if you're dealing with a hardcore modernist in regards to those who go to the early turn of the century, 20th century uh, school of thought. So modernists deny the divinity of Christ in that regard and all miracles because they go against the empirical structure of how the natural laws work. So the big thing for the modernist is to reinterpret Christianity, to reinterpret Christ, to reinterpret scripture. And Rudolf Boltman, a Protestant modernist, brought the term demythalization. We have mm -hmm. to demythalize scripture to find the true meaning, the true message yeah. of it. Paul Tillich was another Protestant theologian who looked to break the myth so that we can truly understand what is being said in the sacred scriptures. So, so we've heard the problems. stories of the denial of Jesus feeding 5,000 people with five loaves of fish or five loaves of bread and a couple of fish saying, no, people just open their baskets and they shared with each other. That's one way they, they try to demythalize that particular Correct. miracle. Yeah. And the resurrection would be how we all through Christ, if we live through Christ, we are redeemed through the life. So we resurrect spiritually. Okay. That's how they would view uh, demythalizing uh, the resurrection. So and it's still very important, but we have to understand it properly. It wasn't a historical event, according to the heresy of modernism. Now, you've talked about people who are true modernists and then some who are maybe not at the same level. Um, but I, I look at Correct. somebody who can't believe that Jesus is God, doesn't believe in the fact that he is God and can perform miracles, doesn't believe in the resurrection, how they can still consider themselves a Christian. That's an unbelievable thing to myself that I discovered at university uh, some 25 years ago. So mm -hmm. I finally uh, cornered the professor after 20 questions to get him down to the point where he finally said, yes, Jesus is not divine. He finally gave in on that because I was a lot younger then and I wasn't as well read. And it took me a while to figure out because I couldn't believe that a Christian school was saying that Jesus is not God. So, so I was baffled by that. But they, but they still claim to be Christian very happily. Yeah. 
And so the modernism has kind of ebbed and flowed throughout the 20th century, and, and we see it today. Um, how is it, it kind of, maybe um, Pope Pius X's encyclical was meant to try to stop it in its tracks, mm-hmm. but it kind of resurfaced again. Let's talk about that, how it has resurfaced and where it is today. Yeah, Pope Pius X really did stamp it out, and it went underground. And it started to reemerge in Vatican II. And there were many, we called liberals then, Uh, they weren't as hardcore modern as some of them, uh, the Hans Kuhns and later the Karl Rahners uh, that were more ecclesiastical uh, modernists where, you know, they might question the the primacy of Rome or the Eucharist or things of that extent, or women priesthood, things of those. Uh, And some of them were even to a point uh, moral relativists. So these are all flowers of the same uh, poisonous heretical root of modernism. So they exhibit some of it. Uh, I am not positive they would ever dare say Jesus was not divine. So some of them were not as bad. But throughout uh, a lot of the uh, articles in uh, documents in Vatican II, uh, uh, especially Lumen Gentium, the Constitution of the Church, you see almost like a battle with their elements trying to infiltrate against the Holy Spirit guiding the council. And uh, that's where a lot of the reemergence came in. And we also saw a lot of other horrible things enter the church through that era, that, that whole ordination class from the 60s and 70s, where mm-hmm. we received a lot of the church abuse from the priest that later came. So it was all uh, just a fruit of this of this horrible heresy, maybe not directly, maybe indirectly a little bit. And it led to a lot of uh, horrible things that occurred. And fortunately through Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict, there was a push back at it. We saw the, the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which was an excellent guide against any form of moral relativism. We saw also in the late 70s, Inter Signores, which condemned once and for all any idea of a woman priesthood. And I think a lot of these reforms and the reforms of the seminary really helped. But we still have a very uh, culturally re- relative uh community within the church with morals. People are divided whether abortion is right or wrong, uh, whether uh, birth control is right or wrong, whether homosexuality as as an action is right or wrong in itself. So we have a lot of individuals that don't know their faith now because of that time period. And we have a lot of cultural uh, relativism, moral relativism existing. Uh, And And this is why it can be so insidious, because when you look at atheistic communism it truly is atheistic it throws god out completely and so you can almost identify that easier than a modernist viewpoint which tends to come packaged in this alluring different way you know a different way of thinking look at things differently and i can see where it can ensnare you into thinking you're being enlightened and really what's happening is your faith is being degraded and torn apart and 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 your your doubt it's in It's infusing doubts into you about the true nature of God. Yes, under the guise of intellectualism, under the guise of uh, being culturally sensitive to others, uh, not being bound by a obsessive, I mean, an oppressive uh, patriarchal structure, which they would call uh, the hierarchy. Uh, so they, they plan they plan it to look like these types of things that we're doing really good progressive things. And all they are really just this, they're, they're root offshoots of modernism. I think it'll, it'll be pretty hard nowadays. I mean, I know they got to be out there, but I haven't seen any in a long time where you have a priest that might deny uh, the divinity of Christ or the resurrection. You might have a few who went to older seminary and they might be a little shaky on their Old Testament miracles or how Genesis is interpreted. Uh, But for the most part, I don't think you're going to see these types of hardcore Losey or Terrell modernists that are saying Jesus isn't God on the pulpit. Mm -hmm. You'll still find that at the university, probably, uh, unfortunately. Uh, But you're probably not going to find it as much in the churches. What you're going to find in the churches more are uh, the more diet modernists, as I Mm -hmm. call them that are moral relativists to a certain extent uh, when it comes to uh, uh, 
gender, homosexual, marriage, the priesthood, whether it's uh, if women can be ordained or not, abortion, uh, contraception, remarriage in the church, those types of issues, uh, you uh, are more likely to come across that. Mm -hmm. uh, I might come across a few who might uh, question the real presence, but uh, you'd really have to look hard, I think, now to find a priest openly saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I think mm -hmm. that would be now, thankfully, that would be uh, a, a case for the bishop just to really come down hard on that a particular individual. Do when, you think, oh, sorry. When prior, maybe in the 70s or 80s, they might have been able to get away with some of those sneaky lines. Well, you know, in the 80s, I was in college here in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I remember some of my theology classes and my, I was really questioning some of the stuff that was coming from the instructor who happened to be a priest from Ireland. And I was so naive and trusting that I was getting good theology, but there was something that was raising my red flags. And now as I'm older, I'm understanding I was getting moral relativism, but mm -hmm. I didn't understand it at the time. And I kept pushing back in my papers against the professor. I never did get an A out of him. <laughs> yeah, that's... But I do remember the book we had to read. And now I, I go back and read the book. I'm like, hmm, now I know what they were. They, they was, he was pushing this on us. And I was not understanding this is what was happening. Mm -hmm. And moral relativism is a very, very dangerous thing. I mean, because again, under the guise of intellectualism, it's you think you're teaching some en enlightened freedom for others and you're not being biased. Uh, you're not being prejudicial to other beliefs. You're not being uh, uh, like in a way mean to other individuals because you have this belief. And that's how society is making you feel now whenever you express the truth that you are oppressing another person's right mm -hmm. by making a statement of truth. They've somehow um, tied uh, that together that you are a prejudiced, biased individual if you speak the truth, even though you're not trying to oppress anyone, you're just speaking your mind. And so moral relativism has really become a lot more powerful in mainstream society now where people can become canceled right very easily for expressing their beliefs beliefs and you can see that just in that recent case with the kansas city kicker mm -hmm. just all he did was state truth and he right. and the media bashed him for it at least the left did so but modern is modernist real hardcore modernists who would deny the divinity of christ who mm -hmm. obviously probably deny the holy trinity as well correct uh, I Did they didn't believe really in that? discuss that much with them about the Trinity. I never really got into that. Uh, the, I mean, that's not something that's an inner working of God. That might not be something that they would deny or not. I do know, uh, studying from Paul Tillich, that some modernists believe that God is a being and others said he is the ground of all being. Mm -hmm. So there was really no, it just depends on uh, uh, what, discipline of philosophy they're from. So uh, could they believe in the Trinity? Maybe. Uh, the Trinity is something that, though, that was revealed in Scripture, so they might be a little uh, doubtful of how it's being interpreted. Uh, some might, some might not, but uh, some believe he is a being. Like I said, others would say he's the ground of all being. So some of the real hardcore modernists, though, are still teaching in Catholic colleges, Christian universities. Would you say that's true? I can't verify. I do know in 2003, I, when I was at university, uh, they were. Okay. I had a one who was Protestant who said Jesus isn't God. And I had a couple others that had no problem saying that Jesus is not God. So was there ever any pushback from the students on some of this or? Most uh, of them just sat there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, they, okay. Uh, because the, the books that we read were they they were they're intellectuals they like uh -huh. reading their own words hearing their own speeches uh they're very arrogant uh and uh they write very in-depth philosophical work so most average believers can't even tell what they're reading if they're not trained in theology or philosophy they'll so probably put the book away because it's so boring at that time did you were you recognizing some of this i was beginning to catch on to it uh, uh -huh. now i look back and i can read through and understand everything they're saying, but I understood maybe every other sentence. That's why I was really confused because at that time I was not uh, aware of where they were coming from. I didn't know their angle of attack. 
I thought they were Christians that believed Jesus was God the whole time. So what I'm reading here is I didn't know who these individuals was. I should have read a biography on the authors. Mm -hmm. And then I would have known where they're coming from because they had a, they had an agenda mm -hmm. and I didn't know what their agenda was. Mm -hmm. So the so modern I'm reading something that a Muslim writes about Jesus, I'm going to have red flags. Mm -hmm. I'm reading something from a Catholic college. I'm assuming that these individuals believe what the church teaches. So when I was reading it, I thought they were just really in-depth thinkers and they really weren't, they weren't that impressed. So are modernists, are they um, wanting some kind of ecumenical thing to happen as well? Or well, that, modern, yeah. A, what is their most, goal? What, what most would modernists goal? would like to see uh, a more uh, collegial church, uh, mm -hmm. less authority in one individual, a church that is more open to both women and men serving in the priesthood, a church that is open more to uh, the homosexual agenda, uh, mm -hmm. blessing same-sex unions, uh, those types of things. Uh, some would might water down the sacraments a little bit. Uh, others might not. It all comes down to just what they understand. The big thing is individuals are just, uh, from this last generation, they're just not educated enough in the faith to see stuff and a lot of the a loss of the sacred mm -hmm. is no longer seen in a lot of the churches uh just one little example and this is i'm not judging this individual or any of these individuals uh it's just how they were trained but uh, eucharistic ministers at a big cathedral just simply take the host and put the host back in the tabernacle and uh nobody bows as the cup goes by or anything like yeah. that with, with the eucharist uh, they just go in, close it, walk away. One lady actually just walked away without genuflecting. So mm -hmm. I just sat there and I was like, well, this person didn't mean to offend God, obviously. Mm -hmm. Probably a very good person. But it's an example of the lack of understanding of the nature of the sacred. And that's what modernism wants to do. Modernism looks to take away the mystique of the sacred. So you're not aware of it. And that's why one of the big movements, I really didn't go into this time obviously, but a lot of the churches uh, after Vatican II, uh, the altars were turned around, communion in the hand, which isn't in itself necessarily a sin, but it is a breaking of the sacred. Right. In uh, the tradition. Axing the statues, breaking tradition away. And the moment you take tradition away from the people, not that it's the most important thing, Christ taught us that, but tradition also keeps us in line with what we believe. And the moment you separate us from it, you can easily infuse new ideas. And that was one of the reasons why the modernists moved in to destroy that past as but, much as they could. And that was by destroying these beautiful statues, removing these stained glass windows, putting the altar to the side as far as you can. Well, it so almost has a little bit of a Protestant. Protestant. Yes, agenda. very much so. Catholic modernists are very, uh, I have a very Protestant ideology. And that was one of the big things in Vatican II. And also with uh, the the, uh, the new mass, a lot of the uh, Cardinal Ottavani was very concerned about a lot of the Protestant language that was being put in to the mass, uh, devaluing devaluing it as a, a sacrifice, but just as a table where bread is, mm -hmm. you know, instead of mentioning the body and blood and a sacrifice and stuff of that effect. So, so I was going to say, Ottavani was very much uh, objectable to the new. Uh, liturgy's wording. So given that the modernists tend to uh, question supernatural power of God, miracles, they would not really believe the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ, I would think. No, no. Because uh, that would be a miracle. A Protestant, a Protestant modernist wouldn't already. A Catholic modernist probably wouldn't either. So in the, in, and given the um, many Catholics who have walked away from belief in the real presence, do you think that they have had a great impact on our church? Yes, uh, simply by the fact that with my one example, I just mentioned how Eucharistic ministers behave mm -hmm. in the Western church. Uh, there, there's no sense of the sacred. And so mm -hmm. that needs to be reestablished and not just for purpose of tradition, but purpose of example. You bow just to show the younger children that there's something special that is taking place, something mystical, something uh, very powerful, uh, instead of just... Uh, uh, what appears to be a wafer and some person who's in lay clothes is walking up. 
uh, I have a lot of issues with uh, the abuses. Now, I'm from the Eastern Church, so we don't have these types of abuses with the Eucharist. We would call them abuses in the Eastern Church. Uh, in the Western Church, uh, they're permissible, so uh, I can't say it's necessarily wrong. I just say it's a bad example. So it seems to me that there's a lot of um, parts of the church, including my own parish, that are starting to go back to the Vatican Council II documents and reread reading them and looking at what they actually called for and mm -hmm. kind of studying the history of how things got so messed up. There's several books, many books out now kind of correcting yes. what Vatican Council really said. And, and I even read a book where they're saying the American media had a lot to do with mm -hmm. how it was know, putting it on the wrong trage trajectory in the first place. A lot of the translations, a lot of the certain mm -hmm. optional hymns, uh, uh, Pope Benedict came a long way in making sure that some of the uh, translations were corrected. Mm -hmm. I don't know if many Western Catholics noticed, but at the at the Eucharist, uh, the blood was shed now for many, not yeah. all. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was corrected. Uh, my sacrifice and your sacrifice, the priest says, instead of our sacrifice, mm -hmm. which is very key because the priest represents Christ, not mm -hmm. us. And there's like little things like that that you will notice. Uh, also, instead of saying, and also with you and with your spirit. Mm -hmm. So there's just a return a little bit to the proper translations. And that was a lot of work through Benedict and uh, Pope John Paul II prior to ensure that. And I can tell you one thing, uh, and I know they were doing a good job, Benedict and uh, John Paul. John Paul was Pope when I was in school. The modernist teachers I had did not like Cardinal Ratzinger, who would become Benedict. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very irritated how she was so excited, she would talk about how Carl Rahner was her hero and how mm -hmm. she would always go to his lectures and how the spirit of Vatican II was going to take over the church. And that's a modernist buzzword. And she goes, they've just destroyed it. They've stunted the spirit. Mm -hmm. And then I just laughed and she gave me a dirty look. <laughs> well, it seems like there's kind of a little bit of pushback going on. And even with this Eucharistic mm -hmm. revival, um, a sense of the church trying to correct itself. Would you, and I, I do know that a lot of the younger uh, generation is becoming more conservative. They're seeking the sacred. They are. Because yes. I remember one uh, a bishop saying, I didn't become a priest so I could serve crackers and grape juice. Mm -hmm. And that's not why he got ordained. It's a wonderful phrase. I love that. Why would you bother? I think it was, um, oh, famous author. Can't remember. She's, her name is slipping me right now. She said, why, would, why, why bother if it's not the body and blood of Christ? Why would you bother mm -hmm. to even come on Sunday? Mm-hmm. So there's 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 kind of a seeking of that sacredness and the return to liturgical norms and rereading of Vatican II and finding out what the real spirit was about. The true and, spirit, correct. Yeah, and I, I'm hoping that is there's going to be a correction that the fruits will really start to come forth. Um, why why should we still be concerned about this? I know John Paul II is back in the 90s and 80s. He was warning about this. Um, Mankind's trying to build a system without reference to a creator. And he mm -hmm. warned about this relativism that was replacing objective truth. And this was going to be a new crisis in the church. Well, we're certainly living through it right now. And we're fighting against this. We're still fighting. Um, how would you direct, if somebody's listening to this, and, and how would they see modernism today? What would? Why is it still so dangerous? If you've got a young child going off to college and they're going to a Catholic college and I was even at a very good Catholic college and I was getting this. So how would you, what would you like to say to them? Well, I think first, in my opinion, I'm not going to speak for everyone. I think some people have different experiences with their churches. Maybe some people are more conservative than me. Uh, others might not be as trained in theology and not notice certain things. But for me, I think the church is reforming. I think it's reforming its seminaries. I think it's producing good priests. I think the bishops have been put in line. Now, I think there's still going to be always that uh, red fever to be a cardinal, that type of corruption. But I think the church is reforming itself. I think the church is also fighting very back against modernism in the church. Uh, and I think the big problem is what you mentioned about moral relativism, what is right, what is wrong. Nobody knows anymore. The church has lost its authority. 
in the in the secular world. Nobody wants to hear what the church has to say anymore because the church itself has committed some of the greatest atrocities in the last 25 years to little children, and they hit it. Uh, so the church has to prove herself again. Right. And it has to help people understand that it's not the faith or Holy Mother Church that did this. It was evil men who misused the faith for their own gain. And that's usually always the case when religion goes bad, evil men misusing the faith. So the big thing for the church against modernism is to regain her moral compass to the world so that she can guide the world. Because the world right now is really living off the fruits of modernism in regards to moral relativism. But the, it's even going beyond because modernism is still theistic, at least. They're right. going and accepting atheism, secularism, and whatever other form of cafeteria religion that fits their moral life. And that's what they're choosing. Now, for Catholic parents, uh, they, they need to ensure that their children are taught about the faith, not just the prayers, but taught about the faith. That means understanding these things as they get older. I mean, you're not going to talk about modernism to a 12-year-old, but you're going to teach children the faith through the catechism of John Paul II. If you need a commentary, get a commentary with it. If you need to go back to the old Baltimore catechism for a child, use that. Use whatever you can to teach what is right. So at least that's there. And then as they get older, start teaching them some other things about uh, what other people believe and why they believe it and what we believe and why we believe it. And that no one has a right to make fun of your beliefs. You have no right to make fun of their beliefs so that they grow strong in the faith, that they understand it. And if they are going to college to be aware at a secular university, obviously, but also at a Catholic university, you're probably going to come across individuals who do not believe everything in scripture is true. And you might come across a few who might say Jesus is not God. Mm -hmm. And it's a warning system. Mm -hmm. So by the time they're going to college, they should already know that uh, these things exist, mm -hmm. not just to listen to everything your professor or your instructor teaches you. Now, I know that most people don't go back and read the Pope's encyclicals, but I have found myself doing that more and more lately. Oh, yeah. Um, Pope Pius X's encyclical, Pascendi. And I recommend it. It's very good. And he also has a list of the heirs of modernism, which you can look at. It's just a long list. Uh, Pascendi is a little bit difficult of a read. You might not going to be able to read it in one night. You might have to reread it a couple times, depending on uh, your academic level. Pius was a, a philosopher. Uh, he was, in my fact, a, a, a church doctor. He should be a doctor of the church. Uh, he was very intelligent. And when you read how he writes, you'll see his understanding of, of the heresy and also of philosophy. He, mm -hmm. he, he was truly a very, very intelligent man, much like Pope John Paul II. And the full, the full and title, title of this encyclical is Pascendi Dominici Gregis. Correct. Right. And and you, you can just go on the Vatican website and look up the encyclicals by St. Pius X. Yes, and, and you can find it there. Uh, he'll list about the various errors that they do. Uh, one of the big ones is vital immunism. Uh, vital immunism is a modernist belief that you'll read about in Prescendi. And it mm -hmm. just teaches that the only way that uh, a, a Christian or a believer can feel the presence of God is through the spirit. Uh, okay. There is no external source that he can hear from God. He hears and is guided through God, through the spirit. And that's one of the big modernist tenets for moral relativism. As we've been talking about, the spirit of God pushes the people to change over time. So dogmas can change. And that's okay. one of the things Pius X was very much against. Dogma doesn't change. Church laws can change, but dogma does not right. change. So given that this is a uh, Fatima apostolate, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering what does a modernist, how do they view Marian apparitions or something like the miracle of the sun that happened at Fatima? No, they would outwardly deny that to begin with. They would look for psychological evaluations of the children, and then they'd probably reject anything that was contrary to what they believed. They would obviously deny that Mary is the mother of God mm. because they don't believe Jesus is God. Uh, they would deny the assumption because they deny the resurrection. So how could Mary 
also assume. Uh, they would deny the Immaculate Conception as well. So all of the Marian doctrines that are taught for what we do for reparations for the five first Saturdays uh, would be denied by modernists. They would not believe any of those things about, uh, and that she was an, a virgin, a virgin mm -hmm. birth. So they would deny all the Marian uh, doctrines. Okay. Without hesitation. Huh. <laughs> I didn't know it, and still call themselves Catholic or Christian. Or, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We, yeah, no problem at all. What the one, left of the one guy, you... the one professor, he was going to church next next day because he had okay. us over for Saturday for and, a little seminar. And when he goes up to receive communion, what is he thinking he's doing? He, he was a Presbyterian. Oh, okay. All right. He was teaching at Catholic University though, so yeah. he still should believe that Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, interesting. And so we need to be aware of these heresies that are always around us in our institutions. They're in our secular society. They're in many ways, in, in so many ways coming at us, and we got to learn how to recognize them. And so to seek truth always. What other advice would you have for people? I mean, I know I go to the Adoration Chapel a lot. I read my scripture. I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. I pray my rosary, those kinds of things. Um, God has always guided me along the path of truth, even through my, you know, di difficult, naive days in college. But I also had, I do believe Mary having a devotion to her helps because she said at Fatima, my Immaculate Heart will be your refuge in the way that will lead you to God. So what other ways can we kind of protect ourselves from these things? Exactly what Mary has taught us, as you said, to stay close to Mary the rosary, the scapular, they will, those things will keep you close to Our Lady, who will make sure you never venture away from her son. And that's what I believe. That's why I wear my scapular and I pray my rosary as much as I can. And it's interesting to me that while these this type of heresy was rising in the late 1800s and the early, uh, 19th century, 20th century, late mm -hmm. 19th century, 20th century, was the same time this whole... Um, theology around consecrating yourself to Jesus through Mary from St. Louis de Montfort and then the Fatima message, this idea of consecrating ourselves to the mother of God, because I just feel like these dangers are around us. These, we don't understand them. We don't see them. We're not, we're, we, we can't read the philosopher's mindset and, and understand it, but yet these dangers are filtering down to us and stealing our faith from us. And that's why the simple message of our lady to consecrate yourself to her and, and have this Marian devotion was a way that she could help her children hang on to something. Yeah, and that's all you need. You need yeah. Our Lady in your life. You can have all the intelligence in the world and write all these great papers on philosophy, but if you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God and you're a Christian, uh, you have zero wisdom. Mm -hmm. And wisdom is the most important thing. And wisdom of a child, just knowing that Jesus is God makes them far more uh, intelligent than that individual who wrote that paper could ever be. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for joining me today. I'd love to have you on again. And just for our listening audience, Mark is the son of Katie Moran, who's my normal co-host, and she'll be with me again next week. We're going to be talking about communism. So the, the uh, Divini Redemptoris, that was an encyclical written by Pope Pius XII. No, Pope Pius XI. The 11th. That's a easy to understand encyclical, and I refer to it often when I'm trying to help people understand the roots of communism. So thank you again, Mark, and I hope you have a good day. Oh, thank you for having me. All right.